So, uh, constant acceleration. I've called this topic constant acceleration because it really is the thing that will distinguish it from some of the other things that we look at later on in mechanics. Within this topic of constant acceleration, we will be looking at distance time graphs, which you'll already be familiar with from GCSE. We will be looking at speed time graphs, which I believe you should also be familiar with from GCSE, but we're just going to kind of amp it up a little bit more, OK? Then we'll look at the SUVAT formulae. Those of you who, those of you who do uh, physics will have already come across these SUVAT formulae, um, but we'll be looking at them in, in like a lot of detail and really trying to see where they come from and how we can use them. And then the last, of, the last thing we'll be looking at is vertical motion under gravity. What on earth does that mean, vertical motion under gravity? Yeah, it means how things fall, okay? How things fall, or, te or also if you had like a tennis ball and you threw it vertically upwards, how does it behave? I mean, we all know how it behaves. It goes up and it comes back down. But specifically, how long does it take? How long will it take to do five meters worth of that journey? What speed will it be traveling at, at after five seconds? Um, and the theme of all of these things here is that acceleration is constant. If acceleration is constant, you're allowed to do these things. If acceleration is not constant, you will not be allowed to do these things that we're talking about here. And that's why I'm trying to make a big deal about this, because lots of people in the past will try and do things, particularly these SUVAT formulae, they'll try and do them when acceleration is not constant. So this whole topic, I will refer to it as constant acceleration throughout. OK? We'll be kicking off by looking at distance time graphs. Um, and sometimes we can call these displacement time graphs, OK? Displacement time graphs will be thinking now um, about the direction of the displacement meaning something. And we're going to try and describe these three different graphs that we've got here. So I just want you to have a think to yourself, and then I'm going to ask some people in the room about this. I want you to think about if the bit running along the bottom is time, which we can see time is measured in seconds, and if this bit along the side is displacement, and displacement we know we use the letter S for, which is rather annoying because it makes us think of speed, but it actually means displacement. What do these three scenarios here actually represent? So just have a think to yourself for 30 seconds. What do these three scenarios represent to a particular thing? And then I'm going to ask a few people what they think about them. Okay, um, Ibtiaz, would you be able to tell me about one of these three graphs, what you think it was representing? The second one, this one here, yeah? It's increasing at a constant rate. What's increasing at a constant rate, though? This one is talking about a displacement. So this is the displacement here. So the displacement is increasing at a constant rate. These aren't talking about falling objects, by the way. We're not studying that yet. These could be, t these could be talking about a car or something, OK? So I agree with Ibtiaz that this one is saying that the displacement is changing at a constant rate. And that's indicated by the fact that the line is straight. But what does that actually mean in terms of what you would see if it said the displacement is changing at a constant rate? What does that mean just to try to explain it to someone? Good. It means here that the velocity is constant. All the speed is constant, but really in this case it's the velocity is constant. Okay? So if you can add that one to your diagram. If the velocity is constant, what does that tell us about the acceleration? Is it accelerating if its, if its speed is staying the same? No. So here, the acceleration is 0, and we've still got constant acceleration. What was that, sorry? Is that for the displacement time or for the velocity itself? For, this is for a displacement time graph. If it looks like this, the velocity would be constant. Okay, We're only going to do a short bit on displacement time graphs. We'll spend more time on, on velocity time graphs. Um, yeah, Nabil. Um, are you sure there should be uh, there should have been enough on the table? Uh, 
Um, Taylor, would you be able to tell me about one of the other two graphs and what you think it might represent? Um, the object and the Good. This one, uh, the object, whatever we're talking about, is stationary. I never know if it's stationary like that. Yeah, I think it is like that. If it's with an E, it's talking about pens and pencils. So the object is stationary, which tells me that the velocity is zero. And we can tell that it's stationary because as time is passing, the displacement is not changing. So it's obviously not moving. If the velocity is zero, is it accelerating? Nope. So we've also got constant acceleration here. Um, and then, Amina, for the last one, what do we, how would we describe this? Accelerating. Yeah, it's accelerating. I should really have said object is accelerating, its velocity is increasing. But I don't know if the acceleration there is constant, because I don't know how its velocity is changing. I can see it on a graph. Can you think of anything that you've been looking at, perhaps with Mr. Udin recently, that we could do to help us find out um, whether the acceleration was constant in this particular graph that we've got here, if we knew the equation of that graph. We could differentiate it. If you differentiate, you would get what its gradient is. And if its gradient was constant, then we would know that the velocity was changing constantly. So it would be accelerating constantly. OK, okay there's just a few facts that I want to talk about to do with the distance time graph. It says that velocity is the rate of change of displacement, which is the gradient of the displacement time graph. Okay, So when you look at them, we can clearly see here its gradient is 0, hence velocity being 0. Its gradient is constant, so the velocity is constant. But here, it's getting steeper as we go across, which means that it's accelerating, because the velocity is getting faster and faster. The average velocity which is going to be different from the average speed, the average velocity is the displacement from the starting point divided by the time taken. Because in these graphs, because it's displacement, if you walked to the shop and then you walked back from the shop, your displacement eventually, if you get back home, will be zero. So this is kind of weird. The average um, velocity, if it's across the entire journey, your average velocity could be zero because you've got some positive velocity in one direction, and then walking backwards would be a negative velocity. So you could have an average velocity of zero. The average speed, however, is the total distance travel divided by the time, obviously from speed, distance, time. And what I've put in that extra box is just a reminder is that the distinction is important, because if, um, if you went out, then sometime later traveled back home, your average velocity is zero because your eventual displacement is zero. Okay. And we're just going to look at an example with this, and then we're going to start looking at some things with speed time graphs or velocity time graphs. So here we go. This should feel pretty familiar from stuff with GCSE, so I'm not going to spend too long on these. Let's read through together, though. So you've got this in your booklets on the next page. You ready? A cyclist rides in a straight line for 20 minutes. She waits for half an hour, then returns in a straight line to her starting point in 15 minutes. This is a displacement time graph for her journey. We can see some of those sentences represented in the graph. She takes 20 minutes. Um, and in those 20 minutes, it looks like she's gone five kilometers. She waits for half an hour, which takes us to 50. And then she cycles back in 15 minutes that we've got there. Part A says, work out the average velocity for each stage of the journey in kilometers per hour. So from O to A, the average velocity velocity is equal to the distance divided by time. So we're going to have 5 divided by 20. 5 divided by 20, though, but what, is he, what units would 5 divided by 20 be? So we've got, this is in kilometers per minute. The question very clearly says, I want it in kilometers per hour. So what do I need to do to convert it? You could either do that, but if you've got it in this, you can still do a conversion from this stage here. If you're going a quarter of a kilometre in one minute, 
what do you need to multiply it by to say how far? Good. So if I want to times it by 60, I'll do a quarter times 60, and then I'll be in kilometers per hour. And a quarter of uh, 60 is 15 kilometers per hour. But we also need to do some of the other journeys. AB, what's her velocity? Zero. Zero, she's not moving, she's been waiting. And then from B to C, her average velocity, what's her displacement in this time? Between B and C. I would be careful. I think her displacement is five, but she's also coming backwards as well. So it, it's kind of a bit confusing how we would say it. I think we could say just five, or we could say minus five. If we said five, we'd have to say coming back home. So I'm probably going to stick with that. I'm going to say that she's going five, but this time she's doing it in 15 minutes. So it's five over 15, and that's in kilometers per minute. Let's change that to hours by multiplying it by 60. So we get 20 kilometers per hour, but I'm going to say going back home. Because it's velocity, we want to say what its direction is. We could have said negative, but I think that just gives it a bit more of a, an explanation. So the average velocity for the whole thing is not going to be an average of these three speeds here. It's not going to be an average of this, this, and this. The reason it's not going to be an average of those is they're all different time periods. So you have to consider the whole thing, the average velocity. The displacement is zero. Yeah, the displacement is zero because she's gone all the way to wherever she went, and then she's come back again. So her displacement is zero. And we're dividing it by whatever, 65 minutes. So her average velocity is zero kilometers per hour. But her average speed, we're going to just consider the distance that she travelled. What distance did she travel? Overall, for the entire journey, she's travelled 10. She travelled 5 kilometres to get there and 5 kilometres to get back. So her total distance travelled was 10. And the total amount of time that she was travelling for was 65 minutes. Again, that's going to be in kilometres per minute. So we're going to change it into kilometers per hour by multiplying by 60. And we get 9.23 kilometers per hour to three significant figures. The 10 is the total distance that she traveled. Notice how it's distance and not the displacement, because she traveled five kilometers there and five kilometers back. So it's 10 kilometers overall. Why is her average speed so much lower than the other speeds, the other velocities from part A of the question? We've got 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers, and then it suddenly become 9.23 kilometers. Good, because the average speed has taken in the, the stop when she just sat down for half an hour. So obviously, overall, her speed is going to be dropped because of that thing that we've got there, okay? Now, I've written exercise 9A here, but actually, I think we're going we're gonna to skip exercise 9A because it's, it's just interpreting graphs that you could do from GCSE level, okay? And it's very, very rare that this kind of thing would be in an exam. And if it was, it'd be a godsend because it would be super easy, okay? So we're going to start looking at the different types of graphs that we might be coming across 
next. If you're still writing it down, that's fine. If you are not writing down, if you can start looking at those next three graphs and think, what would the interpretations be of those next three graphs? And I'm going to pick three more people to give me what their interpretations are of those next three graphs. And when I say the next three graphs, I mean these three graphs that we've got here, OK? So I can leave it on that page if anyone's still writing down. But I want to hear you talking about what should those next three graphs be like. Those three, yeah. Oh, there's a line. There's a line at the. There's a there's a line at the bottom, okay. For the first one, there's a line at the bottom. And these are obviously velocity time graphs, okay? Okay, have you had a chance to think about them? Um, Hassan, would you be able to tell me about one of these three graphs, bearing in mind that this is a velocity time graph, we've got time along the bottom and velocity along the side. Which one do you want to tell me about, number one, number two, or number three? The first one, what does the first one show? It is stationary, which means that its velocity is zero. We can clearly see the velocity has a value of zero as we're going across here. Locke, could you tell me about the second one or the third one, please? The second one has got constant velocity. What does that tell me then about the acceleration? Good, it's not changing. The acceleration tells us how velocity is changing. If the velocity is constant, then it must have no acceleration. So now a flat line, when we're looking at a velocity time graph, which is the most common one we will be looking at, a flat line now means that it has just got constant velocity. So um, Ishraq, what does the last one show us? It is a non-constant velocity, it's changing. What could you tell me about this type of acceleration? Do we know if it's constant or if it's varying? No, the acceleration is actually, it's constant here. Because for every, every second that goes along, it's getting faster by the same amount. For every second that goes along, it's getting faster by the same amount as we go, OK? So this one is constant acceleration, which is great, because we've got an example now of, um, of something that we can use in this whole topic of constant acceleration. If it was a sort of a curve like this, it would be non-constant acceleration, which will be something that we will look at in a couple of chapters' time, OK? And we won't be able to use these kinds of things for it. Constant acceleration is just going to be a straight line. And there's a couple of properties here that are very, very important. If you ever come across these questions, they will use definitely this second property and mostly this first property here. The first property of these graphs is that the acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity. So it is the gradient of the velocity time graph. Here we can see its gradient is zero, so the acceleration is zero. The gradient is zero, so its acceleration is zero. The gradient here is constant, so it's constant acceleration. That's what we see as the property that represents acceleration. This second property here, I'm putting a star next to it because if there is a question that is a speed time or a velocity time graph, you will be using the area underneath a velocity time graph to give the distance travelled. Okay, You will be using that to find the distance travelled. Notice that it's the distance travelled there and not the displacement. Okay, It is the distance that's travelled. It says in the little bit to explain this, because I'm just telling you this fact and I want to explain it a bit more. We'll see later in chapter 11 from Pure that when we differentiate displacement, we get velocity and therefore integrating velocity gives the displacement. Now, you don't even really know what integrating means, but integrating is like the opposite of differentiating. Um, integrating also finds the area underneath the graph. So there's some of these meanings behind it. That's a bit abstract. So what I thought I might do a quick bit of explanation is if we just look at the second graph here, we've got that this is its velocity. 
and this is how long that something has taken. How do you find the distance using velocity and time? What is distance equal to from GCSE? Distance is equal to velocity times time or speed times time. Velocity times time. So velocity is this length alongside here. Time is this length alongside here. If you do velocity times time, it's basically finding out the area of that rectangle. So the area of the line, of the curve, sorry, the area of the space underneath the line is the distance travelled. Okay, that's sort of where it comes from. Well, that is where it comes from. It also works if you were to have it with non-constant acceleration, okay, or things with lines going all jagged and stuff. The area underneath is the distance travelled. You will use that in, I would say, nine out of every ten questions on speed time graphs. So we'll do a couple of examples and we'll do a bit of practice. Um, I'll do some practice on the whiteboard today. You haven't done that for a while. Can I go on to the next page? Okay. So this one's going to be nice and quick. The figure shows a velocity time graph illustrating the motion of a cyclist moving along a straight road for a period of 12 seconds. The first eight seconds, she moves at a constant speed of six metres per second. So look, we can see constant speed of six for the first eight seconds. Everything on the graph represents what's um, in the words. She moves at a constant, oh sorry, she then decelerates. Decelerates means that she's slowing down at a constant rate. Constant rate means that it's going to be a straight line, which is good because that's what we want it to be. And she stops after a further four seconds. So we can see here, four extra seconds takes us from eight to 12 that we've got. Find the displacement from the starting point of the cyclist after this 12 second period. So it's asking for us to say how much has she displaced in that time. In other words, what is the distance that she's traveled? The way we're gonna work out this distance is the area underneath the graph. I should imagine many of you would look at that shape and go, oh, I'm going to just do it as a rectangle and a triangle. OK, I'm going to recommend quite strongly now that you do not do it as a rectangle and a triangle because you have to trust me of knowing where the course goes and it's eventually going to have things with algebra in it and become more complicated. I want you instead to consider the shape that I've just shaded in as a trapezium. You should remember the area of the trapezium. I've put it in here as a, in case you've forgotten box. But doing these things as trapeziums, or trapezia, which is the plural, is the best way to do this, OK? Do not split it into rectangles and triangles. You will still get the same answer, but when we do some trickier ones with algebra, you will have a messier time, and you will probably make mistakes. There's two ways of remembering the area of a trapezium. You either find the average of the parallel sides, and then the height, multiply it by the height between them, which is the same as a half A plus B H. A half A plus B is the average of the parallel sides, and H is um, the height. So in this case, the distance will be the average of the parallel sides. What are the parallel sides in this? Eight and 12, yeah. That bit is eight, that bit there is 12. So it's a, an average of eight and 12 multiplied by the height which is 6, so that becomes uh, 8 and 12 is, is 20, half it is 10, so it's 10 times 6, so it is 60 metres. And it's metres because the whole question is talking about things in metres, OK? That's the way I want you to find things when there is trapeziums, not as rectangles and triangles. Part B of the question says, work out the rate at which the cyclist decelerates. What did we say that the... Um, deceleration would correspond to on the graph? The gradient. So we're going to think about how much it's changing in the y direction and how much it's changing in the x direction. The change in y is 6, and the change in x is how much? 4. So it's 6 divided by 4, which is uh, 3 over 2, or 1.5 meters per second squared. Now, because I have used the word deceleration, I can just write 1.5 meters per second squared. But when you look at that gradient, does that gradient look like a 1.5 gradient? 
what do, it looks like a minus, okay? If you wanted to, you could have said that the acceleration was minus 1.5 meters per second squared. But because I've used the word deceleration, I don't need to say minus anymore. The deceleration is telling me that it's slowing down. This is going to sound painfully obvious to many of you. If it is accelerating at minus 1.5 meters per second squared, every second, the velocity is decreasing by 1.5. I know that's really obvious, but some people just don't see what acceleration actually means. So it's going to go from 6, it's going to go to 4.5, it's going to go to 3, it's going to go to 1.5, and then it's going to go to 0. I know that's obvious. I just wanted to say it so I don't have to say it again to someone in the future. Okay? Very boring so far. It's going to get a lot more complicated than this. Do you want me to go back to that page for a second? Okay. Start reading through the next question if you've already got that written down. And we'll read through this together in just a moment. But it's going to become more complicated as we go. This is very introductory at this stage. Okay. This time it's talking about a particle. Oh, I wonder if anybody looked over the modeling assumptions. What does it mean if it's a, a particle? Good, something that is so little, we shouldn't really consider its dimensions. And if it's so little, and we're talking about the way that it's moving, can anybody remember what other things we don't have to take into account if it's so little? Sort of friction, air resistance, okay? So whenever we talk about something as a particle, we're just saying, don't worry about air resistance, okay? A particle moves along a straight line. The particle accelerates uniformly from rest to a velocity of eight meters per second in T seconds. The particle then travels at a constant velocity of eight meters per second for five T seconds. The particle then decelerates uniformly to rest in a further 40 seconds. We're going to sketch a velocity time graph to illustrate the motion of the particle, and then we'll consider what we do in part B. Okay, but let's start off just by thinking about part A. For part A, whenever it asks you to do a sketch, it literally means a sketch. It would be nice if you have a ruler to do the axes and the lines, but it does not need to be to scale. Okay, it does not need to be to scale. So I'm just going to do a sketch of what my axes are going to look like. Along the bottom is always going to be time and along the side is always going to be the velocity. And we're just going to break it down into the three separate sections. It accelerates uniformly from rest to a velocity of 8 in t seconds. So there's 8. Let's call that bit there t. So it's going to go up to that bit there, OK? But instead of labeling t here, you may find it more, um, you may find it easier to sometimes label the distances along the bottom. And that's what I've got written in this box here. Tip, sometimes it's easier to indicate the period of time that has passed using arrows rather than the time at the end of the interval. And you'll see what I mean. I'll do a bit of a comparison of that to show you. What's the next stage of the journey? What should it look like? Constant velocity, so it should be a flat line. And for how long? 5t. So I'm going to put some dotted lines down here to make it a bit um, more obvious. And now I can say that it is 5t, that distance along the bottom. Rather than writing the time at the end of the interval. So actually, the time at this stage would be 6t. But that can get a little bit confusing. So if you want to, you're welcome to just label each section of the axis for how long each section of the axis is. It then says it's going to take a further 40 seconds to come to rest. So I can now label that as 40. If I wanted to label the time at the very end, it would have been 6t plus 40. And that's when the axes start looking a bit messy. So it's a bit easier to say it in these three stages. The marks usually come from here. Have you got the correct shape? That's one of the marks. The second mark will come from, have you got the correct velocity labeled? The third mark will come from, have you got the correct labeling for the time axis? OK? Could this be a question that would come up? It, it would probably end up being a little, bit, a little bit more complicated than this. But yes, this is, this is the kind of thing that will come up in your mechanics in year 12. OK, now we get to the point where it says, 
Um, sorry, it says give then. It should say given. That doesn't make much sense. Given the total displacement of the particle is 600 meters. I suppose that really should say the, the total sort of distance that it has traveled. Given that the total displacement of the particle is 600 meters, well, we now know that the area is equal to 600. And this is where um, the trapezium is going to be much more helpful. So we know the area is equal to the average of the parallel sides added together. What are the parallel sides? What's the, the lengths of the parallel sides, um, Nabil? So you've got this distance here is one of the parallel sides, which is 5t. I'm just going to write that at the top so it's really obvious. And then we've got this bit along the bottom, which I can add all of those up, plus t plus 5t plus 4t. That's my half a plus b, or my half, my averaging of the parallel sides. And I'm going to multiply that, multiply that by the height. What's the height of it? Eight. Eight. OK. So we can now start trying to solve this. We've got 600 is equal to, probably what I would do here is I would see I've got a half at the beginning, and I've got an eight at the end. So I'd probably put those bits together and say I've got half of eight. So I've just got four. And then I'll simplify what I've got in here which is 5, 6, 11t plus 40. <coughs> so this is the top side here, and this is the bottom side here. And what's the best thing to do at this stage for the equation, do we think? Should we expand the brackets? I wouldn't expand the brackets. I would actually just divide both sides by 4. Because I can see this is being multiplied by 4, so I'm going to divide by 4. So I get 150 is 11t plus 40. I get 110 is 11t. So t is 10. That's the answer to the question, because it just says find the value of t. What other things do you think that they could have asked you there, actually? What could they have asked you? Any, got any ideas for any extra things that they could have said instead of find t? Yeah, like how long was the journey? What was the total journey? So all you would need to say is, OK, well, that's 10, that's 50, that's 40. 100 seconds is the whole thing. Maybe they'd say, give it to me in minutes. 100 seconds. One minute, 40 seconds. So you just got to think, you know, don't just get to an answer and then think you're done. Make sure you have a look and see if there's anything else that needs to be done here as well. OK. Um, we will have a look at this one question, and then we're going to do a bit of practice, and then we'll come back and do some together as well. Now, this is a real exam question on this particular, um, this particular topic. It's on the next page, yep. Did you really have to ask me that, Nabil? Surely you could have just turned the page over. <laughs> no, it's OK. OK, so this is a real exam question on this topic. So, um, Councillor, this will, this will kind of answer a bit of your question, OK? OK. And then we're going to do lots of practice after this. It says, a car travels along a straight horizontal road between two sets of traffic lights. The distance between the two sets of traffic lights is 1,500 metres. As soon as you see distance and 1,500 metres, I would be thinking, ah, oh, maybe they're going to make me do something with the area under the curve here. Maybe they're going to do something about the area underneath this graph. In a model of the journey, the car leaves the first set of traffic lights accelerating uniformly from rest until it reaches a speed of v metres per second, then immediately decelerates uniformly until it comes to rest at the second set of traffic lights. The car completes the journey between the two sets of lights in 120 seconds. Sketch, there isn't a diagram below because I've taken it from a, an exam paper, a velocity time graph which represents the above model of the journey of the car between the two sets of traffic lights. So the key things here is that it accelerates uniformly from rest until it gets to V, 
and then it decelerates uniformly to rest. What's this going to look like on a graph? A triangle, fantastic. This is going to look like a triangle. It's going to go accelerating, and then it's going to stop accelerating. And the whole thing is 120 seconds. And it reaches a speed of v. Where have I put my middle of the triangle? I put it at 60. Am I right to do that? Yeah. Does it say anywhere in the question that? It didn't say anywhere in the question that it does that, does it? So technically, I could have done this. Maybe it accelerated really quickly, and then it decelerated. Could have been that. I'm just not going to label that it's 60. That's just probably what a, a, an average human would probably think, oh, it's going to just, it's going to be like that. But it didn't tell us that, so we're not going to put it like that. And obviously, it could have been a shape like this as well. Okay, That's another shape that it could have been. You only need one of these. You don't need all three of them. Okay, should have labeled T here, and these are V as well. Using the model, find the value of v. Well, they've told us something that was rather important that we underlined at the top. The distance between the two sets of traffic lights is 1,500 meters. I'm not going to rearrange the equation. I, I suppose not. What I'm, I'm actually going to look at the area. The area of this is 1,500. The area of this is 1,500. And the area of this is 1,500. So. The area we know is 1,500. So 1,500 is, for a triangle, base times height divided by 2. So that's the base times the height divided by 2. So if we solve this equation, we've got 1,500 equals 60 V. So V is how much? 25. So v is 25 meters per second. This is part A. Of the, well, this is part A. This is part B. It is given that the car accelerates uniformly for t seconds. Explain why there is a range of possible values for t which satisfy the requirements of the model. So that's a very strange question. But what do you think that might relate to in our first diagram here? Because it said, given that it is t. So, if we substitute that, that would be t. So that could be t. That could be t. That could be t. Does it matter what the value of t is? Will that change anything? No. So what we need to say about in um, part C of the question, the area will remain 1,500 for any value of t between what and what? Good. It can't really be equal to 0 or equal to 120 because it just doesn't really make sense for it to accelerate for 120 seconds and then immediately decelerate. It would just be very, very odd for that to happen. So it's the area will remain 1,500 for any value of t um, with t between this. Say so We could say the base and height remain the same. However, you could explain that. And then we want to state an improvement to this model. You could do that, but I don't know if that's going to, I think the model here is just actually talking about how far that it travels. I'm trying to think, I actually think there's, some, there's a problem in the way that they have modeled this situation. There's a problem in what, some of the ways that they've assumed it. And I'm going to draw your attention to 
this paragraph. This isn't very realistic, some of the stuff in this paragraph. That's what it's saying. It's trying to say, how do we make this more realistic? Is there anything here that you think is not very realistic? Uniform. Yeah, the uniformly bit. Have you ever been in a car? If you want the car to accelerate, immediately decelerate. accelerates uniformly until it comes to rest. Things like that don't actually happen. So maybe what we could change is we could say it's not going to be uniformly. So for part D, one improvement of the model, um, I don't know why it's being funny, whoops. Um, we could adjust the acceleration so that it was not uniform as this is unrealistic. And then you're going to have a go on the whiteboards for me. Um, at exercise 9b, the even questions, okay?